Welcome to Hope at 7. Thanks for being here. And um, it's Thursday. The Thursday before Christmas. You know what my family's having for Christmas this year? Hot dogs. And maybe boigas. Shipped all the way from Joyzy. That's right. How you guys doing? So this morning, um, just a couple things to tell you about before we get to the devotional today. And uh, it's, good. it's a good one. And I can say that because it's not me, but uh, <laughs> I just wanted to point that out. Um, this uh, Friday, if you can pop by Ask You's and uh, enjoy some Christmas carols, have a cup of coffee. I'll be there from 2 to 5, and uh, we're going to be singing Christmas carols. And You can sing along if you want, but um, if you want to as well, bring a donation for BC Flooding. Every little bit helps. Little by little adds up to a lot. That's this Friday from 2 to 5. You can pray for me as I sing at the uh, school and Moms and Tots on Friday too. Got to sing at the Senior Center yesterday and it was an absolute pleasure to do that. And uh, also our Christmas Eve service, if you guys are wondering about it, is outside at the Hub. Stage, bonfire, a hot chocolate bar to keep you warm for the 45 minutes um, long service and then you can visit as long as you want. But it's going to be outside so dress warm and it's uh, we're supposed to get Christmas snow. Instead of the reason I stopped doing Christmas at the hub was because it rained all the time. So now we're just going to do Christmas snow, which is just fantastic. It's going to be like minus four. It'll be a short service, but it's going to be a good time together celebrating Christmas outside. The reason I chose outside um, a couple months ago is because um, I didn't know what the restrictions were going to be. And it looks like there's more coming down. So we're actually going to be able to have a Christmas Eve outside thing we're planning for this year instead of having to watch a screen, which isn't any fun, right? So anyway, um, let me pray, and then we're going to dive into God's Word this morning. We're going to talk about uh, Jesus, the God-man. I thank you um, for your Word and for the truth of who you are, Lord Jesus, our hero, our Savior, our God, the one that came to save us. And I pray that... Um, your grace would be sufficient for our weakness. You cover cover all the things that are aching in everyone's hearts. I pray for Hans Fisher, my friend, that Lord, your miracle would be upon him, that he would be resuscitated from this um, sickness of COVID and he would recover, Lord. And I pray for um, all those that are hurting this morning and uh, may they be encouraged by this truth, this good news, Jesus, for our soul. Amen. All right. Well, the good news is, is Dr. Timothy Keller has a word about the God man this morning in his second Advent talk from this year. Here we go. For our next Advent devotional, we're looking at the next part of Matthew chapter 1. Very famous passage again. They're all famous, of course, because we listen to them every year at Christmas. Verse 18, I'll start. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's Matthew 1, 18 to 23. What obviously is being said here is that Jesus Christ is both divine and human. He has a human mother, Mary, so he's biologically on his mother's side, a human being. On the other hand, he has a divine father, and what is in her is conceived by the Holy Spirit, and his name is Emmanuel, God with us. God, he's divine. Us, he's human. God with us, he is divine and human at once. That's the doctrine of the Incarnation. 
and that's what we celebrate every year at Christmas. But what does that mean to us? And I just very briefly like to uh, lay out four practical implications of the doctrine of the Incarnation, that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human. Four practical implications. The first one is, because he's God, there is no middle ground when it comes to Jesus Christ. There's no middle way. You're either completely for him or you're completely against him. You see, if he had just claimed to be a great man, or a man with high God consciousness, or something along those lines, then you, you might listen to him and say, well, I, I don't know whether I should uh, follow him or not. I'll have to decide. I'll weigh things up. But when he claims to be God, then you either have to fall down at his feet and give him your entire life, or you need to really run away from him in anger or fear. Or, uh, and that's exactly what you see in the Bible. Because of his claims, these astounding claims, uh, to have been to be God, you never see anybody listening to a sermon and afterwards saying, "Nice sermon, preacher. I'll go home and think about it." People either threw themselves down at his feet, or they tried to stone him, or they ran away shrieking. And we live in a world, we live in a society in which most people who name the name of Christ clearly do not really understand this. They don't understand his claim. Because there is no such thing as being moderately Christian. You either have to throw yourself at his feet and do everything in your life centered on him, or you shouldn't have anything to do with him at all. Anything else is completely inconsistent. And yet, most people in this country, I would say, who name the name of Christ, they are in the middle. And yet, that's not taking the doctrine of the Incarnation seriously, number one. Number, so number one is, because he's God, there's no middle ground. Number two, because he's God, there's no fearing of the future. You see, the God that Jesus Christ is, is not the God of dualism. Dualism is a, uh, dualistic religions, dualistic philosophies and worldviews believe that there were two principles out there, uh, a good principle and a bad principle. Uh, you even get that in Star Wars a little bit, where you talk about, where they talk about the dark side of the force and the good side of the force. And the idea there is that you have good and evil locked in a kind of endless battle because they're equally uh, powerful. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is omnipotent. The God of the Bible is completely in charge. And nothing can stand against him. And if the Lord of love, Jesus Christ, is God, that means, you know, who cares whether there's life after death? What we care is, is there love after death? <laughs> and there will be. And will all evil and suffering finally be over? If the Lord of love is God, yes, eventually it will all be over. And that means this world, there's hope for it. And that means that you and I, with all of our flaws, there's infinite hope for us too. So because he's God, there's all the hope in the world. Because he's God, there is no middle ground. But here's two more. Because he's human, first of all, because he's human, he understands you can go to him. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. Uh, he's not like a God who looks down and says, why can't you get your act together? Of course, he calls for obedience, but he knows what it's like to be rejected. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be in pain. He knows what it's like to be the victim of injustice. He knows what it's like. Whatever you're going through, he knows what it's like. He understands. Uh, you can draw near to him and get mercy and help in time of need. But lastly, because he's human, we can be saved. <laughs> See, think of it like this. Why did Jesus Christ become human? If Jesus Christ was a completely holy God and not loving at all, why in the world would he have emptied himself of his glory and come to earth and experienced all of this? If he was just a holy, just God, but not a loving God, he never would have become human. But if he was only a loving God who says, oh, I accept everybody, then there would have been no need for him to come down either. He just accepts everybody. But only a holy God who says sin must be punished and a loving God who says, oh, but I, I, I need to punish sin in such a way that I can still love and forgive my people. Only a God like that who's both holy and loving would have, would have become human. And that's why he did it. So that a holy God could satisfy justice and at the same time open his arms to us. 
And if he wasn't human, he never, we never, we just couldn't be saved. Let me just end with his little story. They say, by the way, <clears throat> that uh, Dorothy Sayers, who wrote uh, the Peter Whimsey novels, they say that um, she um, uh, looked into her novels, saw this guy, Peter Whimsey was, a, was an aristocrat, he was uh, smart, brilliant, a great detective, but lonely, you know, unmarried. And what's interesting is she writes eventually into the, uh, the novels and into the short stories a woman named Harriet Vane. Interestingly enough, in the novels, Harriet Vane is one of the first women who ever uh, went to Oxford, by the way, like Dorothy Sayers. She happens to be a, a detective uh, writer, like Dorothy Sayers. And of course, in the books, in the stories, um, uh, Peter Whimsey falls in love with her, and in a certain sense, she saves him from his loneliness, from the life he was living before. And somebody once wrote, and I've always thought about it, was that, was that in a sense, uh, Dorothy Sayers looked into the world she created and saw a man that she loved, and she, in order to save him, she wrote herself into it. She, wrote her, she entered the world, uh, which only she as the author could do, and saved him. But that's what Jesus Christ did. He looked into the world, he saw us, he saw us, dying, he saw us flailing, and he loved us so much that he wrote himself in, and he became a human being, though he was God, and he saved us. Emmanuel, God with us, that's what it means. Amen. And now here's Tim and Kathy Keller for a short time of Q&A. What a great truth for us this morning. God is with us, and Pastor Tim Keller right now, you know, that was just last week, and there's, um, he himself is battling cancer. Um, and uh, um, knows that um, in the not distant future, the cancer will take him. He's got pancreat, pancreat, um, his pet, pancreas is cancer. <laughs> Sorry, folks. And um, so you can be praying for him and Kathy. Go check out the whole video. They've got 10 more minutes of, five more minutes of talking about questions about Jesus being fully God. And fully man, and only when he was fully God and fully man could he come and rescue us people that needed his help. And I want to just play you this song. I want you to listen to the words today. Listen to the whole song. It's beautiful. It's called Behold Him. Because when, when you behold Jesus as fully God and fully man and the Savior that we need, it really has a power to take away the doubt and the fear and to give you a strength that's um, supernatural when you behold Jesus. So let's, uh, let's watch this song, Behold Him. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him he who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake as a child He became like the least of us Behold him Jesus, Son of God, Messiah The Lamb, the Roaring Lion Oh. 
receive all praise. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy, worthy, worthy to receive. fantastic worship song he is worthy of all your faith and all your attention and he is worthy of your stick to stick close to Jesus that's why you're here that's why I'm here we know there's nowhere else to go we don't have all the answers we got the doubts we got the pain we... but we have Jesus and he's gonna fix it He's worthy of all everything. He's the only one that could save. Let's pray. Give us uh, steel in our spine from this truth. We behold you, Jesus. We worship you. You are worthy of all our praise. We can't wait to see you face to face, to see you coming on the clouds, to fix our planet, to save us, to restore all we've lost, to give us joy again, to bring the broken back to health. Lord, that you are our God. And we worship you. We pray for our brother John DeWitt, who's who's hurting right now with cancer and his family. We pray, Lord, that for a miracle, his tumors would shrink and go away. And we pray, Lord, you heal him. And we pray, Lord, for a great Christmas, for, for us to remember you, Jesus, and to be focused on you. Thank you for coming to save us. Amen. You guys have a great day. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.